Thank you for joining us today for today's webinar, Net Zero Homes and Community Resilience, part of the bi-weekly 2021 Art of Resilience Speaker Series. This series is a joint effort between the College of St. Sebastian and the University of Minnesota Duluth Sustainability Offices to bring together campus and community to explore sustainability and equity in a rapidly changing world. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Erke, Sustainability Facilitator at the College of St. Scholastica. And I'm Jonna Corpy, and I serve as the Sustainability Coordinator for the University of Minnesota Duluth. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping topics. So today's webinar is being recorded and we will be able to share a link with you all after the event is complete for your reference or to share with others that might find it useful. We also invite your comments and questions and hope this is an interactive um, and useful part of your time. So please put your questions in the chat as you think of them and Ryan and I will be asking them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, as for format, um, Rachel, our guest, will be presenting for about 20 to 30 minutes and then we'll round out the last portion of the webinar today with Q&A. So before we get started, um, some of you might be wondering how housing and affordable housing fits in with sustainability. So we wanted to make a quick connection um, before we dive in. Um, so housing is practically by definition an environmental issue. So where we build housing and the way that we build housing says a lot about our views on the treatment of the land on which we live, how welcome we, welcoming we are of all people in the neighborhood, um, and yet environmental policy really addresses housing um, and certainly doesn't necessarily address the equity issues involved with being able to afford quality, safe, and sustainable housing into the future. Um, even though housing has a significant impact on land usage, vehicle emissions, climate change, um, and carbon footprints. So um, thinking about that, um, we're really excited today to have Rachel Wagner here um, from Through Design LLC and who is also a co-founder of Green New Deal Housing, which is a new nonprofit, new-ish nonprofit here in Duluth. Um, and we're going to turn it over to Rachel to get us started and tell us about this really exciting project that we have right in our community. Rachel. Thank you. I am going to share my screen. So bear with me, I'm still new to this. And okay, great. Today I'm going to be talking to you about one particular model for resilient community development, which is happening right now in the city of Duluth and the Arrowhead region. As Jonna mentioned, we are a relatively new organization. We launched our website just this past December and as you'll hear about at the end of the presentation, we will be making our public presence known next week when an exhibit about the organization opens called Green New Deal Housing Show and Tell. I hope those of you who are still interested at the end of this talk, uh, find your way to the Duluth Folk School in the next month to learn a lot more about us. I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about resilience in general. And I really think that when we talk about resilience, we are talking about whether or not something is robust or fragile when it encounters stress factors. Those stress factors can be acute, they can be chronic, they can be acute within a chronic system. And all of this I think is really important when we are talking about resilient community development and the resilience in general of community systems. The slide that you're looking at is our two photographs of a house in Duluth, a zero net energy house that was built for a private client. You're seeing one picture taken obviously during a snowstorm in the middle of winter and one in the summer. And you can see the solar panels on the roof in the summer photo. This is a very resilient house. It is comfortable, durable, and able to withstand a variety of different stress conditions, all while performing through the course of a year as a zero net energy home, which I will get to 
uh, in the next few minutes. What happens inside of this house and around this house, of course, is greatly impacted by the resilience of the people, the neighborhood, and the institutional systems and communities within which any one house exists. And I think that when we're talking about housing and we're talking about resilience and community development, if we want to approach develop, housing development in a more robust and resilient way, I think we need to understand in a more broader fashion the stress factors that impact the ability for occupants of any home or any community to live with a measure of resilience. I think that right now, the moment that we're living in with the pandemic has been a very current and acute example of widespread communi community resilience and whether or not the systems in that community are indeed robust or fragile. And I recognize that it may not feel acute because we've been living with this, these conditions for more than a year, but I would say that this is a, an acute stressor rather than a chronic stressor. And we have recognized through this pandemic um, amazing chronic weaknesses with regard to the resilience of our communities and our ability literally to hold up in our homes for months and months at a time and what added stresses occur, for instance, to families who may not have enough money to pay the heating bills. And when your kids were at school during the day and you were at work, you didn't have to run the heating system in your house in winter. Imagine suddenly being home with a family in your home day after day in the winter time when that house is not comfortable or safe, um, or you have to make a choice between paying for the heat or paying for food. These are all, and what you're seeing sprinkled across this slide are just examples of things to pay attention to when trying to look at a more systemic approach to resilience in housing development. Which leads me to Green New Deal housing. Everything that I just talked about in the previous slide led to the development of this new nonprofit organization in Duluth. Green New Deal housing exists specifically because our region is lacking a robust system of addressing the resilience of its community members and its housing and infrastructure, in particular, those who are already uh, disproportionately impacted by economic and environmental injustices. The mission of this new nonprofit is to develop equitable zero energy housing and a green collar workforce in the Arrowhead region. We are a community development organization. And in that, by community development, we are developing the community not just with housing, but also with workforce development. This is something that has been done before, is being done a little bit in our community and in other communities, but not really in the way or the extent or with the specific mission with regard to addressing environmental injustices, climate change, and clean energy that Green New Deal housing has taken upon itself. The homes that we are designing and building are at the core of our approach. And through the design, construction, and workforce training, we hope to dramatically transform the community development in the Arrowhead region with regard to providing access, opportunity, equity, and overall public and community benefit with regard to moving our housing stock to where it needs to be to confront climate change, um, both in terms of mitigation, but also adaptation. Our organization works by um, integrating three different elements. The first is the actual housing. So we are developing, um, but not building ourselves, acting as the developer for zero net energy, single family homes. 
Uh, eventually, we hope we'll be doing multifamily housing as well, but we're not there yet. We are providing workforce training in green construction with a focus on folks who experience barriers to entering the trades with a hope of increasing the diversity of our workforce, but also responding directly to the community need of a waning and aging workforce in construction. The third pillar or element of the work has to do with partnership and public engagement. And this is crucial in the work of Green New Deal housing to ally ourselves with and partner with existing organizations already doing this kind of work in the community so that we can bolster each other's efforts. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about the specific kinds of houses that we're building. Some of this uh, may be familiar to you who are watching. Um, if you are not, it's going to be a very fast and furious primer on zero net energy homes. First of all, a building is zero net energy when the total amount of energy consumed on site at the building in over the course of a year is less than or equal to the total amount of energy generated by a renewable energy system on site during that year. For the purposes of Green New Deal housing, we are talking about solar electric, PV, photovoltaic arrays, usually roof mounted right on the house and the homes are all electric. No natural gas will be burned in the homes. So we are not offsetting CO2 emissions from the burning of natural gas. It's all electricity. The net zero, and these are not off-grid homes. So the grid essentially acts as the bank or the battery. When the array is producing more electricity than is needed in the home, that excess electricity literally passes through to the electric grid for other people to use. During times when the sun isn't shining and the house needs electricity, it's pulling electricity from the grid to the house. Net zero occurs when in the course of a 12 month period, the amount that was generated equals or surpasses the amount that was purchased. Can you do zero net energy in a place like Duluth where it is cold and on a day like today, it is cloudy? And the answer is absolutely yes. We do have plenty of sunshine. Most of you, I hope, are familiar with seeing solar arrays somewhere around the city or in your neighborhood. It does work. It works best, especially in homes, when you combine it with passive solar design, meaning allowing the energy loads of the house to be reduced by using the sun's heat for some of the heating requirements in the wintertime. It also works by reducing the amount of renewable energy required, reducing the total amount of energy required by making the house as energy efficient as possible first. So that's step one, more insulation, more air tightness, better windows, much better mechanical systems that are super efficient, all to reduce, reduce the demand or the required energy in the home. And then that demand of energy can be met with a, what, we would call a reasonable sized PV array. Again, also in our cold climate, it is important to recognize the impact of snow on PV panels. And so to get the best performance, you're hopefully putting that array at an angle where that snow will shed, or you're putting the array in such a position that um, you can manually remove snow accumulation from the panels to bolster the performance. Um, so I've designed several homes in Duluth that are performing as zero net energy year after year. These were custom homes. And in the state of Minnesota and in much of the country, the majority of houses that are built to be zero net energy are custom designs designed by an architect and purchased by a private homeowner. It's not what we would call standardized. Yet it works, it makes sense. These houses are really robust and resilient. The operating costs are very, very low. And it's the kind of home that makes perfect sense when we are trying to address the climate impacts of 
or the negative impacts of climate change, respond to the way we need to move to the future, respond to the need to produce all of our energy with renewables within just a couple of decades. Um, and so we need to transform the way we build most houses, not just the small percent that are built um, for private clients. I think that the answer to that is to take an approach to building that is more similar to what large scale develop, housing developers already do. And that is the standardization of certain components and approaches to the construction so that every time anybody sets out to build a Green New Deal home, for instance, they are not having to come up with a new set of construction assemblies, testing and vetting um, to get that house to perform as zero net energy. That's the work that we have been doing here at Green New Deal Housing for the last year and a half. We've been asking the questions, just like in the production home building industry, what can we standardize and how can we create a suite of details, assemblies, material specifications that are vetted, that are familiar, that can be taught, that can be reproduced, that can be adjusted as necessary. Let's say if you're building in International Falls versus building in Prior Lake, where the climate specifications are slightly different without completely reinventing or having to reissue a fully new set of construction details. We think that this kind of standardized approach can lead to much faster and more widespread adoption of these practices of building zero net energy homes, and that will help drive the costs down. Can we standardize house designs? That was one of the biggest questions. And the answer is to a certain extent, yes. There's something which we'll talk about a little bit later that I call the hurdle of the compass. When you don't know where every house is gonna be placed, we took it upon ourselves to devise a number of plans that could be flipped from east to west, but where we basically put forth where South needs to be on the plan. So you can't take any of these plans and put it in any orientation on the site and expect it to perform as zero net energy. But that's written into the documentation and the specifications. And if we're developing the house or we are selling license use of a design to somebody for use of these homes, there are copious notes about where and how the house must be placed on the site in order to um, optimize the ability for it to perform as zero net energy. So how did we do this? I am not going to read through all six steps, but um, this presentation will be available in PDF form on the Through Design website. You are welcome to it. Um, these six steps tell you how our organization approached a methodology, a methodology to generate designs and a set of standardized details that we think can be built by almost anyone repeatedly and cost effectively. And when I say almost anyone, I'm going to get into this a little bit more when I speak about the workforce training. I think that anyone with construction experience, good intentions, and the desire to build the house to these specifications would be able to build a successful zero net energy home with the plans and specifications as we have outlined them. But they have to be followed. And those doing the building have to understand what they're reading and looking at. So having a really good literacy for plan reading is important. I don't think the plans and specifications that we have put together are ready for a novice. However, I don't think it takes too much training to get to a level where 
pretty much anyone could build the homes that we are designing. And that's where in part our workforce training comes in because not only do we need many, many more homes like this, we need a workforce capable of building house after house successfully, repeatedly, and we're not there yet. This is what we call anatomy of a Green New Deal home. It is uh, an illustration that outlines fairly generally the recipe that we have come up with for a Green New Deal home. We list the typical insulation levels in the upper right hand corner. You can see that they are about 50% beyond, twice as much depending upon which element you're looking at, of current Minnesota Energy Code requirements. So our foundation is insulated to R28, current code requirements are R10, for example. Our walls are R35, that's whole wall R value. Current code is R21, but that's not actually whole R wall value. It comes, the whole wall ends up performing at about an R17. So again, our walls are twice as robust thermally. Our attic insulation is gonna be between R70 and R77, depending. Current code is R49. So you get the picture. This is a much more robust assembly, but it's not passive house level. If some of you are familiar with passive house, this is where the cost effectiveness and the methodology comes in. We vetted the assemblies sort of pushing and pulling our approach to get to something that we felt could perform well with a relatively small house design and not go so far overboard that it would become either um, unattractive for builders to want to step in this direction and also really more than we needed to establish cost effectively. So what does the end result look like? Most of our houses, with the exception of the solar array, probably look relatively similar to what you're used to seeing in a northern climate. The roofs are pitched, which is good for shedding snow. There are porches, which is also good for shedding snow and protecting um, occupants as they come and go during inclement weather, but also provide a really nice space to be outside in the summertime. They are relatively small. The building forms are simple, but well proportioned. The windows are generous but not walls full of windows. The materials are durable. We are specifying materials made in Minnesota and Wisconsin and the region as much as possible. Um, they are easy to operate. So there isn't anything so unusual or esoteric on the inside of the house that a homeowner with a good manual wouldn't be able to understand or operate. There's a thermostat in the hall, um, light switches are what you're used to. There's a water heater, it's a heat pump water heater, but there isn't anything, again, particularly exotic. And this is important both for maintenance and understandability, um, but also for comfort and familiarity for the occupants and resiliency. These homes, because of their durable construction, and robust thermal enclosure can keep the occupants comfortable even during a sustained power outage, especially if the sun comes out. This is just one example of what we call a solar optimized space plan. This design can be flipped east to west so that you can enter on the west side or on the east side, but the bottom of the drawing is south. And our, our specifications for all houses like this, note that this house should be placed within 30 degrees of south. So it doesn't have to be 100% true north-south. And you can kind of see the little arrow to the left of the north that's suggesting that the house might be a little bit off of true south. The house designs are fairly straightforward. Um, they utilize, I think, really good practices of kind of flexibility and adaptability for the kind of living that we do now, more open floor plans for kitchen, dining, and living, which is great for solar, um, passive solar, and 
So there isn't anything super unfamiliar or unusual. The houses are not enormous, but they are not tiny homes either, although we have a tiny home design in the works. The idea behind designing these stock plans and putting as many houses as we can as an organization um, into development here in the Arrowhead region is to create widespread opportunity and what we call equitable access to this kind of housing. So we are calling these affordable homes. They are not affordable homes in the sense that they are intended necessarily for rental or for sale to folks who do not have a means of income. These are being designed right now with um, the intent to sell below the construction cost to qualifying buyers who will probably be making somewhere in the range of 80% to 120% of area median income. And that's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to $65,000 a year for a family of four would be the maximum income level to be able to purchase through the nonprofit. Um, there will also be a way for other entities, both private and nonprofit, to purchase Green New Deal housing plans and build these houses soon. Again, because a goal is widespread housing development of houses with this kind of robust nature to them. As big a component of our organization as the housing development and the housing design has been, has been the development of a workforce training curriculum and set of goals around enacting this curriculum and training. We call it training the next generation to build for the next generation. And, and the reason I characterize it that way is that in the Arrowhead region, our trades workforce is aging um, and not being replaced at the rate that people are retiring. Training programs and construction companies are asking for more apprentices, more recruits, and the numbers of recruitment into the construction trades are not matching the job opportunities. Yet this is continuing to be an industry that is growing. Well, this is an amazing opportunity when it comes to community resilience. Part of community resilience has to do with reliable um, employment, stable and good paying employment. And construction jobs tend to be stable and pay higher than average wages. There will never not be a need for people in the construction trades. It's not sort of an intermittent um, uh, employment sector. In fact, during the pandemic, construction workers were deemed essential workers. And I absolutely agree with that. We know that the younger generation has far more awareness and concern about climate change and its impacts than the baby boomers and older generations. We also know that the younger generation tends to be more aware of and concerned about the structural inequities and injustices that also reduce the resilience of a community. Training in green construction, in high performance, renewable energy technologies, um, safer and healthier building practices is a really fitting and appealing, I think, offering to folks who might not otherwise have wanted to enter the construction trades. And that doesn't mean that we are not interested in training folks already in the trades because we are. We will be offering training along three different sort of pathways. The first will be to existing um, builders in the workforce. The second will be to those who are engaged presently in apprenticeships or other educational programs where they are 
entering the construction trades, but haven't had a particular focus or exposure to green construction. And the third are for people who have no construction experience, maybe hadn't even considered it as a career, but because of learning about our organization and the work we're doing, hopefully this sparks an interest or they are folks working presently with a um, current workforce development program, such as a number of organizations right here in Duluth beautifully offer. And we join in with those existing organizations to bring a green construction focus to some of their workforce training. So this is three different pathways to pretty rapidly increase the skill sets of our community in alignment with more resilient community development. The last part of the partnership and engagement has to do with more general community engagement, awareness, and expertise, participation. And so as a housing organization, we recognize that there is still a bit of a disconnect with a lot of the general population on the impacts of housing and buildings and climate change. But buildings account for nearly 40% of all CO2 emissions globally in the United States as a whole and in the state of Minnesota. And in the state of Minnesota, which tracks greenhouse gas emissions among all sectors every two years, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency conducts an exhaustive study measuring them. And they've been doing this measuring against 2005 emissions. The sector that performs the worst year after year is the housing sector. The emissions, the CO2 emissions associated with the housing sector are going in the exact wrong direction and not by a little, by a lot. As we as a state and a nation attempt to put together long-term strategic plans for reducing our CO2 emissions along the lines in alignment with what the scientists are telling us to do, we need to be dramatically dropping every single year. But between 2005 and 2018, which is when the most recent um, study came out from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, the CO2 emissions associated with the residential sector in the state of Minnesota rose 32%. This is really significant. And this is a big reason why Green New Deal Housing is asking as many people as possible to engage with us, learn from what we are sharing um, and join the revolution. So as I mentioned, mentioned in the beginning of the talk, we are going to be launching our public presence next week at the Duluth Folk School. We've created an exhibit, it's called Green New Deal Housing Show and Tell. We have a half inch scale model, which you see in the picture here, not quite completed, but it is now. We have a half inch scale model of the Evergreen House, the first house that we will be building. We have a section of a full scale wall, it's called a wall mock-up, built so you can put your hands on it, touch it, see the difference between the Green New Deal wall and standard construction. And we have four large panels explaining what we do, why we're doing it, who we impact, how we do it, um, and specifically more about zero net energy homes and our construction. The exhibit will be uh, showing at the Duluth Folk School in their main space during their normal hours for a month. After that, it will move we think it, the next location is going to be the Zeitgeist Atrium, but stay tuned. You can always find out where the exhibit is going to be by going on to our website, greennewdealhousing.org. So as I also mentioned, we only launched this website in December. It was kind of a soft and quiet launch. We are very intentional and cautious about the work that we are doing. We are trying to do it well, do it right, engage with partners, learn from our stakeholders, and produce something that is needed and wanted. We have a lot of wonderful partnership in the community. Um, I'm so appreciative of the opportunity to present and talk to you, and I will go for questions now. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.
Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. That was a great, great blitz overview. I know you can talk a lot more on all of those aspects. Um, so I appreciate you condensing it down into a small chunk for us. Um, one thing that I want to hit right off the bat is that I forgot to specifically mention in your introduction that you are an architect. Um, and I just wanted to give folks a little bit more background. Like, have you always designed sustainable homes or how did you come into this particular area of design in this work? Oh, thank you for asking that. Um, so I've been practicing architecture and design for about 30 years. I was in private practice for more than 20 years. I, I thought that I would design solar homes and solar buildings uh, when I was in college. I was introduced to energy efficient and solar optimized design. And in my naive brain, I assumed that all architects practiced this way because it made so much sense to me. I graduated from college and I got my first job and I rapidly learned that that was not how most architects designed. Um, I had a couple of wonderful jobs with terrific mentors, none of whom were doing particularly sustainable design. And when I became self-employed in 1996 and moved to Duluth, a place where you literally could die if you lost heat in the middle of winter and didn't have somewhere warm to go, uh, I realized that I had an opportunity to practice the kind of design that I wanted. So I focused my work on more sustainable, energy efficient and resource efficient building practices. As, as I got better at what I did as a designer um, and just got older and raised a child and became maybe a little bit more cognizant of the world around me and how my work might fit into my larger uh, perspective on the world, I decided that I wanted to take the skills that I had been amassing and apply them to the next generation, teaching more, but also to those who could not walk into the office of an architect and pay tens of thousands of dollars for a custom zero energy home. I recognized that what I knew how to do and what was being made accessible to those who were most vulnerable and who needed the kind of design I provided the most, it wasn't there. So I said about uh, through design was a response to that, which was how might I now make my way in the world and deliver uh, my training and my skills to populations who need it the most. Amazing. Ryan, are you gonna ask the next question? Yeah, there's a number of questions here. So I'm gonna to try to do my best. So I'm gonna start with some of the early ones and then we'll probably have to consolidate some. So I'm um, sorry about that here. But um, some couple of questions about construction firms. Are, is there local construction firms that have been, you've been working with or um, that come to mind with who can build to these specs uh, was one question. Another one was, um, do you ever plan on partnering with larger construction companies in the future? Kind of, I don't know if kind of what your planning is um, and kind of your intersection with that um, part of the industry. Yeah, those are great questions. So I spoke with several different builders as I was developing the specifications and the standardized approach. And these are local builders who have built houses that um, I had designed or others at the firm I worked for designed over the last 10, 12 years. And so in a sense, they were sort of, they vetted the design and responded and offered suggestions. As I mentioned earlier, there's a hand, well, I think that almost anybody with, with a decent construction background can build these houses. Initially, Green New Deal Housing as a, a nonprofit developer, the first few homes that we build, we intend to build with an invitation to build to folks who we feel can build these the most cost effectively. Soon after we intend to offer projects for bid and have a combination process called RFP and RFQ. And that's um, request for proposals simultaneous with a request for qualifications. So anybody building a Green New Deal home will need to submit something that shows they are qualified already to build this kind of home. And that's because we need this to be done cost effectively. Um, and we also need it to succeed for the occupants who are there. We don't want there to be sort of errors. 
The third thing we're going to be doing, though, that I think is going to lead to even more inclusiveness. So I guess to back up in answer to your question, Ryan, small or large construction firms absolutely could bid on a Green New Deal housing project for the nonprofit. Um, as these designs are let out in the, into the public domain, any construction firm can purchase a set of plans um, and build to the specifications. We are working with Minnesota Center for the Energy and Environment and Minnesota Power to come up with a certification as a certified Green New Deal home. And so even without the nonprofit organization, if you purchase a set of plans, you build to the specifications and you sign on with either CEE or Minnesota Power, if you're in the Minnesota Power um, utility area, service area, you will be able to have it be a certified Green New Deal home, which means that anybody who is buying the home or living in the home knows that it actually did meet the targets and the specifications. Lastly, as we develop the workforce training, um, we hope that those who are in training end up building Green New Deal homes. And that's something I think a little bit further down the road for us, maybe in the next you know, two to three years is a goal for that. Excellent. Um, one question that came in, um, the curiosity is how does the cost of a Green New Deal home compare to an equivalent, equivalent standard home? And because there's two different tracks, maybe you can just elaborate on the, that a little bit for how sure. they're priced. In terms of a, a builder going out and let's say buying a set of house plans and building it just to code or buying a, the set of house plans for the same house, but it was designed as a Green New Deal home, the cost is going to be somewhere in the range of 15 to 20% more to build that Green New Deal home. Um, I think it's closer. Well, let's see. If, so if it's the developer and they were getting the piece of land and they're building, constructing it. Yeah. So it looks like it's closer. We're in about the 15% more range. And that is without the rebates and or tax credits that will come from the renewable energy system. And I'm not quite sure where the tax credits are right now with the new administration and what's happening with that. I have not kept up on it. Um, so I think right now a good rule of thumb number would be to assume the construction costs would be about 15% more. Mm -hmm. And then how does, sorry if I might have missed it when you were presenting. So my apologies, because I was trying to answer one of the questions that came up. Um, but did you talk about how the, the nonprofit will be funded and subsidized for in terms of price to make it affordable for folks to? Yeah, that's a great question. No, I did not talk about how the nonprofit is going to create those subsidy mechanisms for qualified buyers. Our organization is investigating multiple, multiple pathways for that right now. One thing that we are considering is creating essentially a trust fund where individual donors can donate to the fund, which will only be used to subsidize a lower income qualified buyer purchasing that house. So this way the builder gets paid the fair price that we've set, um, but the homeowner doesn't pay that full price. We are also writing some grants looking for subsidies along that regard. And then when we're ready to be building with training programs, the savings in labor costs that will come from utilizing the construction as a training program may offset and provide a, a significant subsidy in that realm as well. So these are the new pieces that we are really grateful to some excellent um, sort of community mentors who are beginning to guide us through this process. Excellent. Um, there's a couple of questions related to our existing housing stock and kind of one's very specific, you know, is Green, New, is Green New Deal housing going to be working on any home reservation, home renovations uh, along with new builds or maybe more broadly, what what where do you see um, Green New Deal housing interfacing with the need to address the and update and retrofit the existing housing in our region? Yeah, that's a good question. It is much more difficult to standardize an approach to renovations, yet there is a tremendous need for much greater 
and more robust renovation to our existing housing stock. I can't answer right now whether or not Green New Deal Housing, the nonprofit as a whole, is going to take that on. I personally have done some work in that regard, again, for private clients. I've come up with some systems that I think are pretty reasonable and can be applied at a wider scale to for more cost-effective renovations. I'm not sure yet how and when to try to put that into action. But I appreciate the question. The more I hear it, generally that's kind of like the seed that I need to push in that direction. Great. Yeah. Another really great question about um, where you're choosing to build the homes and if the sites that are being selected for building are being selected so that new infrastructure isn't needed to be created or that you, you know, might be on a transit line so you don't need a car, um, those types of considerations. We are absolutely looking in exactly that fashion. So initially the only places that we as a nonprofit organization are looking to build are kind of infill existing lots. And our designs can be adapted to have a basement if they need to. So you know, Duluth is a city with a lot of hills. And if we're gonna be building on a hill, it's probably gonna make sense to put in a basement. Although our initial designs were designed as slab on grade, but they've been designed with sort of the back knowledge, like here's where the stair is gonna go if there has to be a basement. That's not to say that these houses can't be placed uh, outside of sort of existing development where either new infrastructure would need to be brought or if it's more rural and it needs to be well and septic, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. At present, our organization isn't looking to do that kind of development, but these plans would certainly be made available to others who were. So, so there's a couple questions about more some um, design decisions and stuff. And so I'll throw a couple out at you here and see. Um, I, so one was just, um, you mentioned no natural gas, uh, that thermal energy, um, um, asking about just geothermal in addition or instead of solar and it, how that was decided to incorporate that or not, or is there an opportunity to incorporate that um, geothermal? What was the decision behind not doing that? Right. Well, the decision not to design for a ground source heat pump or what sometimes you know known as a geothermal mm -hmm. system was one of cost effectiveness mm -hmm. when and also one of technology. Um, the syst mechanical systems and equipment changes faster than the technologies around insulation. And we are work we are putting most of the investment in the thermal enclosure of the house. We are reducing those heating loads and cooling loads to be so small that a small, simpler heating and cooling or what we call space conditioning system can be used and hopefully be more cost effective. So the building energy loads for the houses that we're designing, the heating load is around 16,000 BTUs an hour. To give you a sense of what that means, 16,000 BTUs. Anybody here who's watching who has a hairdryer in your bathroom, your hairdryer is probably, well, so 16,000 BTUs is about 6 kW or 6,000 watts. So that's like three hairdryers. That's how much heat the whole house needs. It needs three hair dryers to keep the occupants warm in the middle of winter. So there's a mismatch with the capability or the, the first cost of doing a geothermal or a ground source heat pump system for a small, super efficient home. If we're gonna do a Green New Deal housing apartment building, a geothermal system might be the appropriate heating and cooling system. Great. I'll do, I, there's a few more that are coming in. I'll, I'll do the next one kind of in order, but then maybe um, we'll kind of switch over to winding things up to it. I, I wanted to asking some clarifications about the focus on, you mentioned the open concept design and um, was wondering, uh, I think from this reader's or this participant's perspective that the older houses had, you know, sectioned off rooms 
and they understood that that was possibly more energy efficient, um, especially from a heat, heat wise due to large spaces needing more heat um, required, maybe loss of heat depending on use and stuff. I, I'm not, I kind of paraphrasing it. So sorry, Luke, if you're doing that, but I think the general idea is um, why the focus on large open concept spaces when it might be um, more efficient to have smaller heating spaces um, in, in this climate. Sure. sure. So the, the common wisdom that being able to close off part of your house is more efficient comes from the older way of building. When our buildings were not efficient inherently, they tended to be very leaky and poorly insulated. And we often had space heaters, fireplaces or small electric space heating kind of stoves and appliances. So you would close off the parts of the house that you didn't need and you would only deliver the heat to the parts where you do need them. But when you make the whole enclosure so robust and the heating load so small, it's less important to sort of close off one part and deliver no heat to it. That said, the open space concept that I was talking about is really just for kitchen living dining. So all the bedrooms have doors, the bathrooms have doors. If someone's living in a three bedroom house and two of the bedrooms are barely being used, sure, go ahead and close those doors and turn the registers off so that the heat's not delivered and you'll save a little bit of energy. Excellent. And I know we're running out of time, um, but one question that we want to get to and we're not going to get to the rest of them um, is, do you feel like there might be any potential funding with the infrastructure bill that's being proposed right now um, and is in front of Congress? I do. <laughs> I hope so. Yes. And I don't feel like this is the right moment to divulge who we're talking to and working with in terms of some of our partnerships, but that was very recently discussed and I hope we will be going after funding that comes through that infrastructure bill. Excellent. Great. I think um, it's probably a good time for us to kind of put pause. There have been a lot of great questions. There's a few more that came through, but I want to give you time, Rachel, to share anything else um, maybe that came to mind during our conversation um, or any other things. I know you want to make sure to encourage people to go down to dovetail. Um, is there anything you'd like to share as we wrap things up here? Um, I would encourage folks to please visit the Green New Deal housing website. It's pretty information dense. You can look at what are called the design plans. These are not construction documents, but they're good illustrations of the floor plans and the exterior elevations of all three designs that we are starting with. You can learn more about our approach to the community engagement, workforce development. And if you read our blog, you can just gain a little bit of perspective as to how we are going about all of this. So I really encourage folks to go to the website. And yeah, Ryan, you said it. I really hope people come to the exhibit and take a look sort of deeper than what I provided today. I'm happy to answer questions. I think you provided my email prior. Um, yeah, I put your um, also your uh, web address on there uh, in the chat earlier too. So they should be able to find that there, I'm assuming as well, correct? Yeah, and we'll be able to put it out in the follow-up email that goes out after we're done. Mm -hmm. I would do it right now. I've got like too many screens going as we're wrapping things up <laughs> here. Thank you so much, everyone who joined us for today's webinar. Rachel, thank you for sharing your insight, your expertise with us today. I learned a lot. Um, and it's always great to hear, you know, these big ideas happening in our local communities. So thanks for pushing us forward in those directions and inviting us all to engage with that. Um, if you have any questions or would like to connect directly with CSS or UMD sustainability offices, please reach out to us uh, via the emails listed on your screen. Let's see if I can get that up here. Um, there we go. Um, and then I'll hand it off to Jana for our final words here. Great. Yeah. Um, Rachel, thank you so much for your time. I know we've only just scratched the surface of affordable housing and its connections to sustainability and the work that you are doing in the community. Um, but also I highly encourage folks to go check out the website. It's really great, well-designed and really accessible for any person, an engineer, or you know, a person who just wants to learn more about green housing and 
yeah, it's just a, a really solid resource. Um, and you have local experts right here to, to chat with. Um, hey, Donna, one spoiler yeah. alert. If you go onto the Green New Deal housing website and you have a question, they ask you to send it to info at Green New Deal housing comes to me. So <laughs> <laughs> I am info at Green New Deal housing. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so then you have your direct contact with Rachel, um, but she's very busy, so don't overload her too much. She's doing way too many cool things. <laughs> Um, and then we just want to um, invite you to join us for our next and final Art of Resilience program that's happening on April 21st at 1 p.m. Um, we will be welcoming uh, Dr. Sally Mamoon, um, who is a uh, researcher at the UMD's Natural Resources Research Institute. Um, and he'll be talking with us about his work on natural resource economics and um, several projects that um, he gets to work with locally and internationally. So thank you so much for your time and have a great rest of your day.